Well, it's uh, good to be with you. I hope you'll feel the same by the end of this morning. <laughs> um, it's a joy to serve with you on behalf of your rector, Peter Frank. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I've been around in this area for a while, but I came to this country in 1991. Now, you will have realized that I don't originate in this country. Is that right? <laughs> so uh, I was ordained in the Church of England and served there for a number of years. Uh, I met my wife in England. She's American. She's from Iowa, which is why I ended up in Iowa in 1991. And I served there in a small little church. And uh, amongst other things... I became a deputy to General Convention in 1997. This is of the Episcopal Church, a long time ago. And uh, you know what they say about you don't ever want to be near where laws or sausages are made. <laughs> well, I was at the General Convention, and already you could see the writing on the wall in terms of biblical authority, biblical obedience, true Christian discipleship, and so on. And so, amongst other things, I was called to this area in 1999 to Truro Church, where I served for about 10 years, and we lived through the trauma of 2003 and uh, the uh, nomination and acceptance of Gene Robinson, a partnered gay man, as a bishop in this church, which had shockwaves around the Anglican world. In 2006, we went again to General Convention, and there was no change, and we began to see the emergence of GAFCON, and then the Anglican Church in North America, and this group of folks who said, no, this way we're walking is wrong, came together, and... Uh, as you know, the rest is history. Although for me, uh, I was called to Southern California to be the rector of a church in a lawsuit uh, where we uh, eventually lost our property and had to do all the stuff that you know well about, very well. Now, why am I telling you this story of disappointment and woe? Well, um, as you know, the suing of churches, suing of individuals, the courtrooms, the loss of property, all of that stuff was part of our sad history. And uh, I've just been realizing that recently in social media chatter, there have been some Anglicans and Episcopalians, not at leadership level, but out there in the world, in the country, saying, let's work together. Let's put aside the quarrels of the past. Let's go down the road of reconciliation. Let's seek the unity Christ calls for. And boy, that sounds so nice, so reasonable. And one of the amazing things, and one of the things I want to bring out, is that they use this parable that we've just read as part of the argument. They say, oh, well, Jesus said, wait a bit. You don't have to disentangle the good from the bad. Jesus said, wait a bit. It'll all sort itself out in the end. And so some people have begun to say, oh, this is Jesus' instructions. And indeed, they quote St. Augustine, who said, weeds today may be wheat tomorrow. And indeed, there is a long history of applying this parable to affairs of the church. And they basically said, as I just outlined, two things. Not, uh, don't root out the evildoers uh, just yet. Uh, let time reveal who the evildoers are. Don't take precipitate action. And for those of you with really good memory, you may remember our bishop, Bishop Lee in the Episcopal Church saying, heresy is always better than schism. Now, 
All of this sounds so reasonable. But I believe it's mistaken. And why do I say that? Well, it's because not only do we have this parable, but also, thankfully, we have Jesus explaining this parable for his disciples. You saw that uh, passage right in the middle of our reading today where we learn that Jesus said nothing to the crowds except in parables. And the reason he did that was that a parable is a story and it's a way of making a point without actually telling you the point. It's saying, here's the story, figure it out for yourself. And parables are really good at that. However, thankfully, the disciples said to Jesus on his own, uh, we need a bit of help with this one. <laughs> Can you see that? They said his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. We don't get it. And so uh, let's just look at the parable. First of all, we've got this man sowing the good seed in the field. Jesus is telling a story that would have been very common to his hearers. They knew about sowing seeds in a field. That was what they did. And they also knew, unfortunately, about enemies and bad seed. You see, bad seed can be windblown. In fact, when I was in Iowa, I used to drive through these huge, enormous wheat fields. And every now and then you'd see a, a little sign that says, this is seed something from the University of Iowa. And we're testing this. And they would have a number and it was good seed. But the farmers had to make sure that they didn't have windblown seed from other places. And in addition... Then, as alas, sometimes now, rival farmers would plant bad seed in your field just to frustrate your crop, to make sure that their crop, which was free, would be more valuable and so on. In fact, the word that's used for weed in this parable, we believe should be translated darnell, and there was a Roman law against planting Darnell near wheat because of its problems. So there we go. We've got the weed. We, sorry, we've got the wheat. We've got the enemy who's sown weeds. And uh, the servants going out saying, oh, I've got a problem here. And the issue with Darnell is when it's young... It looks just like wheat. But when it gets a bit older, pretty quickly, you can begin to see, oh, this is not wheat. And then apparently you need to wait till harvest because if you pull it up in the middle of the season, the roots are intertwined and you lose your crop or at least a lot of it. So this is true. They would say, oh, yeah, that's what we would do. We would wait till harvest. And then we have the extra annoying task of separating these things. And then we'll take the wheat to the market and we'll just burn the rest of it. Just go get rid of it. It's horrible. We can't use it. It's no good for anything. There's the parable. And the message in the parable there, you can say, is we don't lose good seed. We want to keep the wheat. Uh, we'll get rid of the bad crop. But it's tempting to apply this to the church. But Jesus' explanation is written there in black and white, very clear. The field is the world. Not the field is the church. The field is the world. The one who sows good seed is the Son of Man. The good seed... In this parable, Jesus says, is the sons of the kingdom, people. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, people. 
And the enemy is the devil. And the harvest is the end of time. The end of the age. Judgment day, if you like. You see, this parable is not about being faithful in an evil or mixed up church. But about being a disciple in an evil world. Now, I have some sympathy with those commentators who taught against the backdrop of Christendom, like Martin Luther, for instance, who forever was seeing the Pope in his commentary on Scripture. Because Christendom, in the age of Christendom, the world pretty much was the church. The world was Christian Christendom world. So there was a temptation there to apply this in that way. But let's recognize that this world that we live in today is far from Christendom. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. We are living in a world that's opposed to Christian truth more and more. Now, don't be discouraged. That actually has been the experience and the history of the church through pretty much all its life. It was certainly true in the early days. If you think this world is evil today, think about the world the first disciples faced. With law and order imposed by violence and repression by the Roman Empire. If you stepped out of line, you were gone. You kept in line, okay. Christians did not keep in line. Even though Christians are bound to support and pray for and want the best worldly rule they can find. In the end, if the worldly rule says, I am God, worship me, which the emperors of Rome did come to say, Christians would say, we cannot do that. Even the Jewish people from which Christians sprung came to be against them. And the amazing thing is, as you look in the scriptures and then in the subsequent history of the church, the amazing thing about you and me and our forebears in the church is that we hold on to the truth of Jesus in the power of the Spirit against all opposition. And in the early church, they were just a few. But they had this conviction that because Jesus is Lord, the rest of the world was wrong. No democracy there. You could take a vote, but Jesus is Lord. And because Jesus is Lord, he's true. And we follow him. Now, we face a world today where the truth is being replaced by confusion. Just think of some of the arenas in which we're facing appalling and amazing confusion. Sexuality and marriage, do I need to say any more? We are finding people saying, my identity is no longer in who I am or who my family is or anything like that. And for Christians... We want to say, as Christians, our identity is that we are children of the King. But we are not defined by our sexuality. And we are called because, did you know, marriage is an example of what Christ and the church should be, not the other way around. Did you know that? what it says in 1 Corinthians. Let's just take that and make sure we understand it. Christ and the church, the picture is given in marriage. Paul says it's like Christ and the church, not the other way around. It's not that Christ and the church is like marriage. Marriage is like Christ and his church. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's keep going. What about relationships? How we just deal with people in society today? 
it seems like disagreement. If you disagree with somebody, that means you don't want them to exist. That's how people are treated. If you disagree with somebody, they're saying, you want me to go away. Civility and the capacity to disagree peacefully so that true discourse can be encouraged is really receding in some places. And of course, confusion about life itself is in our midst from conception to natural death. Christians have always stood up for life. Do you know one of the reasons why churches grew in the early years? One of the reasons why churches grew in the early years is because in Roman society, if you had a daughter or a child that was in some way not quite what you wanted, you could leave it out. Just let it die. And Christians said, no, we don't want that. We'll take them. And so Christian families grew with the rejects. And I would say the bonuses of the Roman world. Life is another area where confusion and truth is vanishing. And, uh, of course, the most amazing thing is the whole buzzwords today about diversity and inclusion. Do you know, I, it, this is true. This, I am the famous example of this because at a meeting of the Diocese of Virginia years ago, somebody said to me, I wish you would leave so we can be inclusive. That happened to me. I bear witness. <laughs> so let's just repeat. Against all these confusions and oppositions, the early church had the conviction they were right to follow Jesus as Lord, and the rest of the world was wrong. Now, Beyond that whole thing about delaying, let's just note that that's kind of a second message of this parable. Yes, it says, let's delay, let's wait till harvest. And there we see the mercy and the patience of God. But look what's emphasized in this parable. The parable ends like this. No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the weed along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. There's an emphasis on the harvest. Jesus is telling us about judgment, a warning. Judgment day is coming. Are you ready? And in the explanation, see how that's emphasized. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, oh, let me just read the introduction. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The parable emphasizes the harvest. It emphasizes the judgment. It's emphatic. Here is a theme that you do not hear so much these days. Here is a theme we try and avoid. And let's, be face, let's face it, we don't like to think of this. But let us note how this appears in Scripture. That the evil in this world is real. And God intends to deal with it. Indeed, you can say he already has dealt with it on the cross and will be completing that, fulfilling that 
in the days to come. For instance, just in today's psalm, we learned about the insolent man who is against me and about the plea, save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 73. It's a meditation on a very modern question. Why do the evil seem to get away with stuff and the good people suffer and struggle all the time? That's Psalm 73. Read it. And it's a great description of how fantastic these evil people are until you see them in God's perspective against the sweep of history and the judgment they must face. Justice will come in his time. Well, how about St. Paul? Uh, as Paul got preaching, we have two of his sermons recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. One to a Jewish audience in Acts chapter 14, and one to the philosophical folks, the pagan philosophers in Acts, in Acts chapter se- in Athens, in Acts chapter 17. They are very different sermons, very different audiences, but they have two striking themes that are in common. One is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the second is the coming judgment that that resurrection will bring. Or what about that amazing passage that was read for us earlier from uh, Acts chapter, sorry, Romans chapter 8? Do you get those very, that very first line? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. And the rest of the passage amplifies it, demonstrates it. The wonder of life in Christ beyond judgment to his fulfillment. Well, let's wrap this up. The conclusion of the parable is full of hope. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus, I love that phrase. It's basically saying, listen to this. Get hold of this. I'm underlining it. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now, let's remember that the word righteous, you have to be careful with in the Bible. Remember in the parable of the prodigal son, or the first of all, the parable of the lost sheep, uh, 99 sheep are left behind and the shepherd goes and follows after one. And Jesus says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. And look, do you realize that the implicit question in that line is where are these 99 righteous people that need no repentance they don't exist and uh, Paul reminds us again in Romans chapter 3 as it is written none is righteous no not one not one understands no one seeks for God But the good news is this, Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been shown apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward 
as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Well, brothers and sisters, I think that deserves a hallelujah, amen. As we gather around the Lord's table this morning, we are celebrating and demonstrating Jesus' victory on the cross, his resurrection, his presence by his Holy Spirit within us, and his fatherly invitation to sit at the table to sit at the heavenly banquet with him. Brothers and sisters, I believe we took the right turn all those years ago when we said, alas, we can't walk this way. We must walk the way of the scriptures. We must walk the way of the cross. We must walk the way of Jesus as we have sought to follow him in his word. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. And let's just remember that the mission of the church is sowing seeds, not pulling weeds. Heavenly Father, thank you for the amazing truth of redemption. And Father, we know that we are not perfect. We know we are not the naturally righteous. We stand only in the name and under the care of Jesus. And Father, we pray, draw us closer to him day by day as we respond to his love in the grace that has been shown us. May we live lives of grace in his name. Amen. Amen.